Okay, I think we're going to get started. Woohoo! Okay, great. I hope everybody had a good dinner. I hope everybody was well hydrated. And I would like to welcome you. Uh, is the volume okay? Is it too loud or is it okay? I'm getting some thumbs up. Thank you. So I am uh, Russ Altman, a co-organizer of PSB, and I am in really thrilled to introduce the 2019, what we call the LC speaker, Ethical, Legal, Social Implications. This is generally the non-technical talk. We invite significant others and family. We've had a nice dinner. We've hydrated, and it's the time to think big thoughts about science and society. And Larry Hunter, uh, the, uh, one of the two founders of PSB and co-organizer, is today's speaker, and I'm thrilled. So first I'll start off with the demographics, which is that Larry is a professor at the University of Colorado. Actually, his appointments go across two campuses, the Denver campus and the Boulder campus, uh, in pharmacology, uh, preventive medicine and biometrics, computer science, and biology. He, I think, has to, we have to mention right away, is a founder extraordinaire, founder of the International Society for Computational Biology and the first president, founder of the Intelligent Systems for Molecular Biology Conference and the first host of that meeting, founder of this with Terry Klein of the Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing, and founder of the Rocky Mountain Meeting on Bioinformatics that um, happens in Colorado in December. His research, you know, I, ju I just had the privilege of reviewing his CV in detail. If you have any questions, we can have a QA. and a um, The way he characterizes it, and I agree, is uh, knowledge-driven extraction of information, its integration, and its use in the analysis of high-throughput data. And that's a somewhat narrow view of what he does, because if you look at his CV, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention this in a minute, I should say, the toast for my daughter's wedding that I gave went very, very long. Um, but, but the CV is filled. We were just talking about a paper he wrote on cryptogra cryptography uh, eight years ago before most of us could spell cryptography and certainly what did cryptography have to do with biology and medicine. Uh, and it's filled with other things, natural language processing, systems for uh, making inference about new biological facts, kind of an underlying theme of artificial intelligence meets uh, molecular biology. And in fact, Larry has written two, at least two books, two that I know about. One was called AI and Molecular Biology. It was written about probably 20, 25 years ago. He has made it publicly available, mostly because it's out of date. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> but to his credit, he wrote another book, which is not out of date, who, whose uh, in title includes the phrase, I um, can't read my own writing, uh, something of life, that begins with a P, processes of life, an introduction to molecular biology, all in the spirit of teaching technical folks, computer scientists, engineers, non-biologists, what they might need to know, the vocabulary lesson, so they can be welcomed into the field and, and start contributing, which has happened in spades in all of those organizations and all of those meetings that, that I mentioned. He is very proud, I know, of his work creating the PhD program in bioinformatics at the University of Colorado. And for today's, um, he's done a ton of teaching, but I would like to uh, um, highlight that he teaches a class called Ethics for Computational Biology. Again, something that uh, we all should think about and something that is, uh, if you've been following the news and if you heard about the Stanford trained postdoc who CRISPR'd a couple of babies, Clearly, there is more need for training in uh, ethics in biology. Now, I'm on page two now of three. Uh, I don't know if I will ever get another chance to introduce Larry, so I just want to say I really love this guy. I, I really do. I really do. Um, I love him as a scientist because if you look at the CV, the creativity is clear, but what's even more noticeable is there is never or hardly ever an incremental paper. These are f papers that usually open up a whole area and, and is the first paper of that type that you've ever seen. Not always, but a much higher rate than would be uh, expected by random chance. So that's inspiring. 
He's also a leader. I told you all these things he founded. I mean, this was because of a vision of the field that he had that most of the rest of us, it took us 10 or 15 years to have those visions. So that's inspiring. He's a thinker. He's a polymath. He's going to give you a talk in a minute. Look at that title. That is somebody who has an intellectual breadth that many of us only aspire to. And he's a role model. I should tell you, in terms of him being a role model, he founded the first ISMB meeting. I noticed a good idea when I saw it. I hosted the second one. He was the first ISCB president. I said, that looks cool. I think I was the second ISCB president. I came to PSB. Terry and Larry invited me to join the organizing committee. What's the, th the lesson here? If you see Larry doing something, it is not a bad idea to start doing it yourself. Uh, and I really mean that in the broadest sense of, of a leader and a role model. Uh, and also, as a corollary, if you have a chance to do something with Larry Hunter, any kind of activity that he invites you to or that you see on a program, take the opportunity because it is always an enriching experience. Okay, I'm on page three and final. So he's been an inspiration to me, as you can sense, and the thing that is most notable about him as, an, as a polymath and an intellectual is his a renaissance approach to science. He loves new ideas. He embraces them and looks at them. He's open to them, but then he's critical. So if you come to these sessions, who's sitting in the front and who has a question about the papers that's supportive yet kind of skeptical and, and, and pushing the boundaries? That's the exact model for science that you want always looking for new fields. He's always the one who says, you know, there's work in this field that, I've, that the rest of us have never heard of that might be extremely useful to us in computational biology. That's inspiring, that's important. Okay, he's, with respect to this LC series, um, which by the way, I think is one of the great um, positive features of the PSB meeting, and I hope you agree, we've been doing it now for 15, 20 years. He's always been and struck me as the most thoughtful or one of the most thoughtful co of the co-organizers about how we should choose that, what are the topics that are important that need to be uh, addressed. Um, he's devoted to thinking broadly, as, as I've just uh, kind of described, and there are no topics that are out of bounds for him. His incredible vision for the field, his thoughtful deliberation about the field, and his knowledge makes him a perfect speaker for our 2019 LC Talk. Larry, take it away. No way? No way? Oh, well, thank you. Lay. Oh, there is a lay. I just said no lay? <laughs> Ross, and you left your glass here. Yeah. You're going to need wine. This is very ceremonial. I can't believe I forgot it. You shall bow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. Thank you all. I appreciate you all being here. I have to call out, I want to introduce you to Word of Hawaiian. The word is Ohana. And Ohana is a, sort of roughly translates as family, but it's, a, it's more broad than the English idea of family. And uh, the reason that you are all here today is my college buddy Kyle and his older brother Tane uh, and the entire Dada family who fill out the first couple of rows here. This is my Ohana. And they brought me here in 1982 and I was so happy to be here and so so magically touched by this place that all of you are here now as a result. The first bioethics workshop PSB did was in 2000. And the first ethics keynote we did by Rebecca Eisenberg on gene patents was in 2002. Back in the early days of PSB, in those days, we did AI and genomics and uh, nobody knew but us. Okay, nobody had any idea what those things were or how they were going to affect their lives. But now they're in the headlines, all right? They're important to health and to economics and to policing. They're even weapons of war. They're, they are the nature and value of our humanity is now being debated because of all this genomic and AI stuff. So I don't think we're allowed to stick to our knitting anymore. We really have to bring our understanding of those topics um, to engage with the broader community and to think about how what we know and what we can do really fit with the rest of, the, of humankind. And I'm going to suggest two things, two ways to do that. One is to pay attention 
to how the science we do is influenced by the culture that we live in. And that's really important. I'll talk about race and sex and these other things that are dominant in the culture that we are swimming in. Um, and in particular, I'm going to invoke some work from the humanities and encourage you to read more broadly in the humanities. And then I'm going to talk about how we can do good and not harm and what I mean by that. And so I'm going to start with this word. This is the Greek word arete, um, which is what we would mostly call virtue these days. I don't like using virtue because virtue is a Latin word that comes from ver, um, the basis of virile and all that sort of stuff. It means male. And so virtue for the Romans was manliness. And I think that may be one of the problems that we have these days, is that our idea of virtue is tied up with all, these, all this cultural baggage. It was Aristotle who told the, the question of what constitutes the good, or good action, or good character, ethics. And for the last couple of millennia, that question of, of ethics, of what's good, has largely been driven by religion. Okay, the, 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 the course of what is ethical behavior for, for several thousand years was defined not just by, by Christianity, but by religions broadly throughout the world. And then in the last 100, 150 years or so, post-enlightenment, there have been a series of philosophers that have tried to think about what's good, what the right thing to do is, um, and uh, have, have had a variety of theories. And by the time we got to the end of World War II, philosophers were largely exhausted by trying to come up with theories of what was good and retreated into what we call meta-ethics. So it wasn't about how to know what was good. It was about how to have conversations about what was good. It was about how to engage with each other and figure out through dialogue where we had some sort of shared values. And uh, that sort of meta-ethics, shared values, dialogue resulted in what is the basis of uh, NIH's informed consent and the non-maleficence criteria and, and the, the uh, human dignity is important. Those are meta-ethical concepts that aren't grounded in some fundamental thing, but are instead shared broadly among the stakeholders that showed up to those meetings. And I, I worry that that's not enough, and, and I'm not the only one. There's a, a wonderful philosopher named Derek Parfit. Have any of you heard of Derek Parfit? Oh, we got one, two, excellent. Derek Parfit, I think, is the foremost moral philosopher of our era, okay? And I wish that more of you will come to know of him. Uh, he died recently, January 1st, 2017, but his theory was that there really was possible to reason our way to what is objectively good and bad, and uh, that it's possible to do this. And he, I love this quote of his, that there is some hope that we might be able to reason our way to a, a non-religious ethics, and we're really just getting started at that task. And Parfit is such a, an important philosopher because he had an idea about how to do it. And his idea about how to do it was to sort of dissolve the idea of personal identity. His first book is called On Reason and Persons. And his approach to reason says, you know, we aren't the individuals we think we are. We are actually a product of many others, and we, we contain multitudes. Our ancestors, our loved ones, our teachers, our friends, our coworkers, all of our genes and culture and environment come together and we channel them. But we are not just one person. We embody all of those things. So when I say something like being an American is part of who I am, or being in this scientific community is part of who I am, I am saying something literally true for Parfit. So my interests are not only what's good for me, but what's good for the many different parts of me. How I participate in and feel kinship with and value the, the, the constituents that make me up and how I help them persist and, and improve in the future is the same thing I would do to improve myself or to help myself persist. Parfit has a wonderful quote here, which I won't read to you. Um, but it really challenges all kinds of our explanations of human altruism, not just Haldane's version about laying down my life for two brothers or eight cousins, which makes sense genetically, but hopefully we can do better than that. Um, and it reconciles some of the consequentialist philosophers, you know, the Bentham greatest good for the greatest number, with the special affection that we have for our friends and our families and our teachers. Okay, it's a really lovely way of trying to think about what would be good. And it, it gets around a lot of philosophical conundrum that I won't deal with here. But I do want to point out that this is not how Western economists or academics or decision makers think about our future right now. 
Instead, they use this thing called a discount rate. So a discount rate says, you know what, I'd rather have a dollar today uh, than a dollar in 2020. And I'd rather have a million dollars today than a, a dollar a year for the next million years. So how do we figure that out and change the way we value things in the future? And then they use this thing called a discount rate, which is kind of like an interest rate. And so even at modest interest rates, um, it turns out that the, fu the distant future is worth nothing. This is a paper from science thinking about climate change, uh, talking about how to, to uh, handle the, the future, the value of the future. Uh, they propose uh, decreasing discount rates, but it turns out it doesn't really matter that much. You're still exponentially screwed. And so one way to think about this is a 5% uh, uh, discount rate means saving one life today is worth sacrificing 132 lives 100 years from now. And there seems something really deeply wrong with that. And Parfit tries to wrestle with this. And, uh, I just want to note parenthetically that uh, during the last financial crisis, both in Europe explicitly and in the United States because of the the quantitative easing thing, we have negative interest rates, um, which means that I would pay you to hold my dollar until next year so that it would still be there when next year came around. Those negative interest rates flip this on its head and suggest that we should sacrifice hundreds of people now to save one person in the future, which also doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. So what are we going to do about this, okay? What's the computational biologist to do in the light of these big, difficult issues around valuing the future and each other and other people and things like that? And, uh, the idea is not to hide in your shell. We do have to engage. History shows how the consequences scientists didn't anticipate and don't welcome can come from our work. And as, Chris, as Russ's intro suggested about the CRISPR babies, that's entirely possible to do good or harm with our own work in genomics and AI and so forth. So as our work becomes more central to medicine and society, this becomes more and more of a problem for us. This is not an argument not to do science, of course, but to be aware of the culture and society that we are situated in. And this is not easy. It's kind of like a fish trying to study water, okay? A culture just permeates us and we don't see it or feel it. But there is help. I want to point to a piece of the humanities and social sciences called Science and Technology Studies. It includes anthropologists and people like that who look to see how scientists come to know things. Uh, even PSB has been studied, by the way. There was an anthropologist named Joan Fujimura who came here in the 90s and published a paper called The Practices of Producing Meaning in Bioinformatics in 1999. So those of you who were around a long time ago might be subjects in these studies. And they're really interesting studies. The analysis of our work from the perspective of the humanities and anthropologists and social scientists illuminates important things about us and about what we do that we might not be aware of. So it's really worth reading these things. I, I point to this particular book by Kim Talbear uh, because it's a lovely recent example of this sort of work. So Talbear's book called Native American DNA is not actually about Native Americans or their DNA. What it's about is how scientists study Native Americans and their DNA and who does it and why they do it. And the direct-to-consumer market selling uh, tests that will tell you about your Native DNA heritage and about how powerful other people usually the US government, but also the Canadian government and a wide variety of other places, use ideas about Native American DNA uh, to try and pursue their own goals. And the, one of the things that she leaves us with, and it's a fascinating study of what we who claim to study Native DNA do, uh, is some hope that Native Americans can, by understanding not only the science, but the way the scientists work and the way science interacts with culture, can begin to use Native American DNA to pursue their own ends. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit, because there's a long history of exploitation and recent genomic research misconduct around Native Americans. You should all look up the Havasupai versus the University of Arizona case if you don't already know it. And Native Americanness is such a wonderfully contested signifier. It really embodies a lot of our struggles with race and migration and the like that I think are really fundamental to the science that we do. I want to talk a little bit about how. So the top piece of this slide is from Carlos Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, uh, which is the book that coined uh, the, the binomial naming scheme that we all use for, for describing organisms. Um, and he did that for human beings. He also coined the term Homo sapiens. Uh, this is the entry for Homo sapiens in, in Systema Naturae, where he divides Homo sapiens up into four races, which uh, he identifies by geography and skin color. Um, white Europeans, red Native Americans, yellow Asians, and black Africans. 
Um, it's uh, fascinating since he never left Europe and never met anybody who wasn't a white European, so his breakdown of this was, was all through uh, uh, hearsay at the very least. But uh, it, it's really fundamentally and importantly wrong to try and, and distinguish human beings into these discrete categories on the basis of skin color. Because as we know now, having studied the genetics of skin color around the world, and it's fascinating, I recommend you look at that literature, uh, that, that skin color is by and large continuous geographically around the world. There are no places in the world where there are really sharp discontinuities uh, in original population skin color. And there's positive selection on skin color, basically on, on latitude. So it turns out that uh, vitamin D is really important. As you go further north, there's less sunlight. And so uh, our skin, which was evolved in Africa to protect us from UV, uh, needed to trade off the protection against UV in order to get uh, more vitamin D. There's a lovely ca example of how that selective pressure uh, is, is really what drives skin color in the Inuit, the native tribe in the Arctic. The Inuit, unlike most other far northerners, uh, have very dark skin. And it turns out that that's because they have a diet very rich in vitamin D from the fatty fish that they eat. Uh, an example, that, an exception that proves the rule. And where did the discontinuities that, that uh, drive the modern version of race arise? They arose from this bottom image. This is a map of the Middle Passage where slavery brought people uh, over long distances. Uh, and that long distance transportation is what provided the illusion of distinction of different types of that of that boundary between white and black, which is really a continuous change that's driven by geographical adaptation. And so that legacy of slavery is really important in a whole bunch of ways, not least of which is in genomics. So I find this a really embarrassing slide, but I have to share it with you. This is the legacy that shows what a shockingly bad job we have done in doing the genomics of humanity. So if you look uh, at, the, at the part nearest me, let's see, I'm supposed to push on the bottom button here, yes. This is the global population of Europeans, East Asians, Africans, and so forth. Um, and this is the number of genomes that have been sequenced of these kinds. And this big red flag here is all the Europeans that have been sequenced, and a few East Asians, but really precious few Africans. And you can see this as a, as a percentage rather than as a total number, and this is really sad. Okay, and so um, this, by the way, came from a paper called Hidden Risk in Polygenic Scores and Clinical Use. It talks about how this particular sort of mistake that we have made in the sampling of the genomes that we have sequenced really affects clinical applications of these things, and we should, we should pay attention to that. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit more basic science take on it for a second and show you a paper from Steven Salzberg and a student that just came out a couple of weeks ago, um, which shows 300 megabases uh, found in Africans that don't align with the human reference. Okay, that's 10% of the human genome. These are amazing structural variations, and they're spread all over the genome. There is basically no place that doesn't have insertions um, from folk, from uh, genome found in African populations and, and not in European ones. And uh, this isn't too complicated. You should be able to, to understand from basic genetics what is the source of most of the variation in a population. Anybody want to tell me? Time to last common ancestor, right? That's where most of the variation comes from. Um, so if you look at time to, whoops, didn't mean to get to Jim yet. If you look at time to last common ancestor, um, it's roughly a quarter of a million years in most of Africa, 60,000 years for a lot of indigenous populations, and 30,000 years for the rest of us. So the vast majority of human genomic variation occurs in those more ancient populations. And there are villages in Africa that have more genomic diversity than the rest of the planet combined just because of time to last common ancestor. This is where we need to be focusing our efforts. And I want to point out that the reason we don't do that is not just uh, because it, the, it would be inconvenient to sample those folks or, or the like. Um, it's because the geneticists that are most powerful in this world, and this is Jim Watson. The BBC just did a, a documentary on him that aired this week where he was utterly unrepentant and repeated his longstanding belief that folks with dark skin color have lower intelligence than folks with white skin color. White supremacy is very powerful in our world. In 2018, 23% of U.S. whites think there is a racial difference in intelligence. That's what that URL down there tell you about. It's down from nearly 50% in 1990, but it's been pretty much flat for the last decade and maybe back on the rise. And part of the reason this is happening is because racism uses scientific language. 
all right? We need to resist this. It, the belief in human differences in intelligence based on race, or the fact that, that skin color defines a thing called race at all, is a simple failure to appreciate the geographic continuous nature of skin color. Skin color does not define any ancestral population. It's not even a good proxy. Scientists have used skin color extensively to, to uh, oh, I'm sorry, not scientists, I'll get to that in a second. Societies have used skin color extensively to define in differential environments. Different people get access to different parts of society based on their skin color. And segregated environments are really powerful confounders. This Rosenberg commentary that was published last week shows all the different ways that environmental confounds can dominate ostensible differences that you see in, geno in phenotype and in genotypic findings, especially in socially constructed populations like races. Okay, this is, uh, you, you, can, you can see uh, that uh, I, differences in genotype can be exaggerated by differences in environment. Uh, where there are no differences in genotype, there can appear differences in phenotype because of environment. And it can actually go the other way around, where differences in genotype can be suppressed by differences in environment as well. And this leads us to make all kinds of mistakes in the interpretation of our GWA studies. Um, Hao Han Wang presented on Friday uh, a SNP for chopstick eating, which is a pretty obvious example of how we can go wrong in this. Uh, UK biobank findings that use EHR contents as phenotypes um, are, are more subtle and interesting examples. This is my favorite one. There are four very powerful, very significant SNPs for being a marketing and sales manager. I'm not kidding. African and indigenous genomes that are missing are not missing at random, and they're not missing just because they're inconvenient to sample. Many of these groups refuse to participate or are not sought out. There's no value to them. What is the value to participating in a genomic study? Health problems in Africa or on Native American reservations are not well addressed through genomic studies. How are they going to benefit by participating in our study? In fact, they're often harmed by participating in our study. Small populations, tribes in particular, um, those small group sizes mean that sometimes even findings from a single participant can stigmatize, seriously harm an entire community. Think about the discussion for, of, about family members and criminal DNA searches in the privacy session that, that Greg was talking about. Um, it's really possible to harm others by doing genetic studies. So in order to do this, I encourage you to, by the way, follow, read this paper, which is just great. Um, we need to, to develop more equitable relationships and attend to the needs of the groups that we would like to participate in our genomic studies. African and indigenous scientists using these technologies to pursue questions that matter to them and sometimes choosing to, sh to share data that benefit the rest of us would be wonderful. In fact, that's just the opposite of what's going on now where we do what matters to us and we might share data that may or may not benefit them. We need to reverse that. We need to think about the populations we're studying as people with histories, including our history with them. Well, I've been talking about race, which is, I think, overemphasized and this biologically incoherent idea. And now I want to turn to sex, which I think is mostly ignored by genomic research to our detriment. Sex is a fundamental biological characteristic. It influences nearly all human traits. Hormonal differences are extremely powerful factors. And our genome-wide studies of complex traits should be, but almost always are not, sex stratified. Gene by sex interactions are critical to understand the frequent role of sex in the genetic basis of complex traits. Even traits where there's no apparent sex difference in the phenotype still need sex aware analysis because the genetic architecture and environmental mechanisms influencing phenotypic variation might not affect prevalence. So there might be different underlying mechanistic bases based on sex. Sex is the biggest influence on drug action that we know of. Knowledge of the interaction of sex and genetic variation on drugs is clinically useful, um, particularly in toxicities, but also in efficacy. Uh, and if you doubt this, ask somebody of the opposite sex to you about how they relate to the same drugs that you take. There are big differences. And molecular mechanisms that differ by sex might suggest novel targets that we could use to come up with improved treatments for women. 
Optimizing therapeutics to perform equally well in males and females is the ground zero of personalized medicine. Okay, if we can't do that, how are we going to do the rest? And I just point out this recent publication uh, that shows uh, the quite significant difference in heritability on both disease and non-disease traits between men and women. All right, so I've been talking about how geneticists need to pay attention to the context in which their work is done. I don't want you machine learning people out there to think you're off the hook. Deep learning has really taken over in medicine. As, as Barbara Engelhart's earlier talk at the conference illustrated, there have been huge increases in machine learning applications for health, most of which, by the way, ignore gender as a variable. Uh, this is a, a graph that shows the exponential growth. This is log scale of deep learning, just the phrase, appearing in articles in Medline. And this is a few examples of, of recent publications I picked out more or less at random. But these increased applications, this, this huge approach to, to using machine learning everywhere through our health system, means we really need to think hard about the social consequences of our work. We are responsible for this, okay? There have been some lovely books and, and other work doing this. I want to single out Kathy O'Neill's book, The Weapons of Math Destruction, um, which I think is a lovely one, and uh, Joy Bualowini's lovely Algorithmic Justice League, which has done some really interesting things on race and gender and machine learning, particularly around facial recognition. And Barbara's keynote last Friday described seven different kinds of mistakes that we can make in doing these machine learning applications in healthcare. But I'm going to take a somewhat higher level perspective than she did and point out that machine learning solutions to medical problems exist within a complicated and opaque system of incentives in medicine. And because they do, they can do real harm. I'm going to, to take a leaf from Russ's book and single out Beth Percha, who I don't think has ever been mentioned in two different keynotes in the same conference before. But Beth turned me on to this article, which is really worth reading. It's about 10 years old now. Um, but it talks about both the, the chaos and the secrecy that lives behind the pricing of medicine and how important that is because the single biggest application of machine learning in medicine so far has been trying to game this system, okay, has been for billing, medical coding. If you send the right codes in, you get a bigger check than if you send the wrong codes in, no matter what you did with that patient. That's the basis of how money works in the American medical system. There's a never-ending dance between providers and payers about what counts as a reasonable payment and this ratchet going back and forth to try and maximize reimbursement and insurance companies trying to bat it down. Um, an immense amount of human labor and now machine learning is uh, dedicated to this task. There are dozens of companies offering tools and nearly a million Google hits for AI for, for billing. So from a social perspective, this is completely wasted effort. It doesn't improve anybody's care, okay? It's just dumb loss of money. It's like burning $1,000 bills. We should stop doing it. Unfortunately, the greatest victim of this is Medicare, which suffers, at least by some estimates, 10% of the $3 trillion a year we spend on Medicare and Medicaid is lost to waste and fraud, okay? That's a couple hundred dollars for every human being in the country. And unfortunately, the Office of the Inspector General, whose job it is to uh, enforce, to find fraud in Medicare, uh, uses this really exciting system called RAT Stats, which was created by the Office of the Inspector General in the 1970s as the primary tool to combat these machine learning folks trying to scam the Medicare system. The reason that it's worth much more money to have a stolen patient record, or especially if somebody over 65, than a stolen financial record is because of how easy it is to, to defraud the Medicare system, okay? And by the way, be careful because um, it's user-friendly as possible, keeping in mind the program uses technical statistical terms. Poor taxpayers. There are other ML problems that we need to think about. So the privacy session yesterday discussed the genomes being inherently identifiable and therefore difficult to share and had some interesting technical approaches to trying to share genomic data. But it turns out genetic exceptionalism is as wrong there as it is everywhere else. There's all kinds of different ways and different types of data that can be re-identified by clever machine learning system. I like this one. These are wearables, okay? And so I have anonymized wearable data in phenotypes, and it turns out where you go is pretty indicative of who you are. And so there was a machine learning system that was published again just a few weeks ago uh, with a method to de-identify people based on, on their physical activity data sets. This is also true, another recent paper on identifying people from brain MRIs. 
There's all, kind, all of our biological data, any halfway decent phenotype is gonna be re-identifiable. So we're, there's a lot of stuff for us to do, okay? There are a lot of technical solutions to ethical problems that we could come up with that would make it possible to do science without harming the individuals who are participating in the science. I don't wanna suggest that all AI in medicine is bad, so I'm gonna give you a couple of my favorite examples of actual applications, fielded applications of AI in medicine that I think are good. Uh, so we can take, we can, we can find a nice commercial example here. So the Mercy Hospital System and Ayadzi, which is a commercial machine learning company, um, addressed a real problem in the healthcare system, which is that many patients go through a ridiculous odyssey before they finally get the care that they need, being referred from one clinic to the next to the next before they finally find some clinician who understands what their issue is and has a good way to treat them. And so what the, the Mercy System did was uh, use all that data about people going from clinic to clinic to clinic to try and train up a machine learning system that would predict the place ahead of time that would be where you finally got the care that you wanted. And that actually turned out to work and be profitable because all of those visits in the middle did nothing and cost money. And it, the good is not just in healthcare systems. It is possible to do good specifically in a medical application of AI. And I think the important thing to think about when you're trying to come up with a machine learning application in medicine to make it a good one is not to replicate what a doctor does. The idea is not to reproduce doctor's behavior. That's not what we need to do. We want to do better. And this is a wonderful reinforcement learning application in a critically important problem, which is managing, manage, managing sepsis patients. It's notoriously difficult to manage these patients. And if you, if you saw a Tool Butte's talk on the opening day, you know that this is where you go before you die, is, is sepsis. Um, and so this reinforcement learning system actually came up with a treatment policy that re where the, the reward function was reduced mortality, okay? That's the right reward function, often hard in reinforcement learning systems. And what the learn policy did is a fairly modest change from what doctors do now, okay? It was higher vasopressor early and less IV fluids later is basically it. And it really significantly improved mortality, including in an independent cohort. It's a great paper. The results are so compelling that they're already impacting clinicians' decision making. Human beings can look at this and say, yeah, I could do that. I could change my policy along these lines if it really worked. And it might be the case that fielding the system might provide improvements in the timing of the administration of the drugs and the fluids and the like. And so there's a real opportunity here to save lives and do good. But we're not gonna do that by just recapitulating what doctors do. We have to be more creative in thinking about how we apply our technology to issues in medicine. We also have to be more honest about how well it works or doesn't work. We have to really get a handle on our problems about algorithmic snake oil, all right? Some algorithms will save lives, but it's hard to improve on current medical practices. There are a ton of exaggerated claims in the press, which we as experts in this area need to resist and not do ourselves, okay? I think IBM was probably the worst at this, but even when the algorithms work, we need to treat claims about them with the same sort of care and respect we treat claims about drugs or medical devices, okay? We need to limit the claims that companies can make so that they have to be supported by evidence. So medical affairs is a part of a pharmaceutical company that keeps them from saying things that would violate rules or, or regulations uh, about pushing their drugs. And we're very careful about the way we communicate about drugs. We should have the equivalent of medical affairs uh, communications for people who are pushing algorithms in healthcare. And furthermore, once we approve a drug, once we see that it works and it's safe, we don't stop there. We do what's called pharmacovigilance. We watch to see that it still works and there are no new toxicities that have arisen because of it. We should do that for our algorithms as well. We need technovigilance to see that they're still working well, still safe. Um, and I hope that we will all agree that we need a regulatory network that forces every company trying to sell into this healthcare market to treat algorithms with the same seriousness that we treat drugs and devices. So I've been scolding you, I know, ethicists tend to scold people, talking about all the bad stuff that we can do and how to avoid it. But I also want to give you some hope and I love this quote from St. Augustine from the 400s, by the way, which I think would translate into the modern world as, in order to have hope, I have to piss you off and make you brave, all right? You need to actually know that there's a lot of good we can do as scientists, okay? Hope is not a passive thing. 
the hope that we, we want the world to be better because of our work can't be just, well, we'll throw it out there and see what they do with it, all right? We have to be pissed off at the way things are, and we have to have the courage to take on some of those challenges, right? I want to tell you about a few things that I've been doing recently that I hope inspire you a little bit. And I want to acknowledge ahead of time that I'm a senior scientist with tenure, a white guy, old, I got a fair amount of money. It's easier for me to do this than it is for some of you. But I do want to point out one of my favorite quotes about tenure, which is due to an AI guy named Phil Agre, who then quit AI and became an anthropologist, a really interesting character. He said, if you don't do something after you get tenure that would have gotten you fired before you got tenure, you're wasting it, okay? <laughs> there are always opportunities to think about how your work might be good for the broader culture you're part of, no matter what position you are in society. It at least helps with the significance arguments in your grants. But I want to tell you about two things that I've done, and one of which is trying to change how we teach ethics, all right? Something nearly every academic can do, because if you volunteer to teach the ethics course, your colleagues will love you, okay? That's not something most scientists do, all right? And we need to do a much better job about this, okay? The reason that I started teaching ethics was because our research, responsible conduct of research class required by NIH was a disaster. It was so boring. I have never sat through a more boring course in my life. That's crazy. These are really important issues. Students should be energized by how we teach ethics and, and inspired and, and, and feel courage and anger, all right? So I, invo I invented a graduate course, which you can see the URL at the bottom has the, the course materials, and we published an article about it five years ago. Um, and we broke our ethics course up into three pieces, okay? One piece was the bright lines, the rules not to, to cross. And yes, we talk about how not to un, you know, leave syphilis patients untreated and, and you know, freeze people to death to see how it works, the stuff that NIH wants you to talk about. But we also tried to make it relevant, to talk about what do you do when you have an authorship dispute. And I actually, the woman I co-teach this with, Marilyn Coors, and I had an authorship dispute with a bunch of people, ethicists, strangely enough, um, uh, some years ago. And we show the students all of the emails and sort of talk about what, what our perspective was and what the other people who didn't like what we did's perspective was. Um, it turned out to be, by the way, Russ, on that paper about cryptography is the, is, was where the dispute was. Um, but anyway, the students find it fascinating and it's really helpful to have some, something to hold on to about what happens, what can go wrong, what do you do when you disagree about who should be on a paper. Um, and for that matter, we try to make our course in the bright lines and the rules part be actually useful. So when your professor hits on you, what should you do? Okay, that's not the same thing that shows up in most responsible conduct of, of research courses. But that's only about a third of the course. The second part of the course is the big picture. We talk about why do we do the science that we're doing? Who pays for it? What do they think they're getting out of it? One of my favorite parts of the course is when I ask students where the money comes from to do research, and they all say NIH. Then I say, where does NIH get their money? And there's silence. And then I say, Congress? Taxpayers? Voters? And they're all like, ooh, hmm, that's complicated. Why do they do that? Good question. Important to talk about. And we talk about it internationally as well. How does science get paid for in China? How does it get paid for in Europe? It's different. Um, and how it gets paid for really changes what science we do. And how we choose what to study and what parts count as doing good science and get you good publications and what parts don't. Those are socially constructed, okay? There's nothing inherent about you know, working on cancer that makes it more important than working on some obscure bacterium. And so that big picture really allows people to think about how to situate their work and what problems to choose and the like. And then at the end, we do my favorite part, we call the deep questions. I say, look, you guys are really well educated. You know an awful lot of stuff about computer science and genomics and all kinds of other things. There's a lot of this stuff coming down the pike that's going to be important. Let's talk about some of those issues, CRISPRing babies or uh, neuroscience in courtrooms or uh, enhancing drugs, you know, so should you take Elderall before you take your comprehensive exam? Um, those kinds of questions, and students love those. We let them pick, mostly. Um, and they're incredibly dedicated to doing research and debating them and coming up to conclusions about them. We can make ethics classes really interesting and fun. And I don't think I'm the only one who does this. Russ has, course, has a similar course that's aimed at undergraduates with very much, I think, the same kind of spirit to it, where the idea is to get people to really wrestle with these hard, important questions and not bore them to death about the Belmont Report and the Nuremberg Principles. All right. The other thing that I've been doing recently is trying to meet underserved communities where they are, 
and give them tools that they can use for their own ends. And I've been focusing on trying to reestablish the broken trust that we have with Native Americans and create a cohort of Native American researchers uh, who are able to bring technical skills like genomics and, and, and machine learning and data science um, to their own interests. And so this is a, a, a cl classroom-based undergraduate research experience. It's been taught for a couple of years now. It was originally developed by a woman named Jocelyn Lee at HHMI. And this year we're doing it um, again and expanding a little bit and doing a little more data science. Um, but it, it's really fascinating because our way of en enticing people is to stay away from the stuff that has been so damaging to Native Americans, studies of, of human genomics, and instead focusing on the use of, of genomic technology and things that really matter to them. So uh, this is uh, uh, Fort Lewis College is in Durango, Colorado, which is uh, in near Navajo land, um, and is very uh, badly scarred by mining accidents. And, uh, the King Gold Mine, where the EPA accidentally let loose a bunch of heavy metals into the river that runs right through the campus at Fort Lewis, um, is, is really important to them. And as is uranium tailings and arsenic and all kinds of mining deritis that's, that's left on those lands. Um, so we use microbiome uh, assessments to monitor uh, the pollution on those lands. And it turns out that the communities and microorganisms, both in the water and in the soil, are very responsive. Uh, to, to uh, metal concentrations and other kinds of pollutants. Um, and students are fascinated by this and want to be able to use this to, to monitor the pollution and how it's affecting them and, and their lands and their communities. Um, and so it's really, they're very excited about doing this and we can teach them how to collect samples and do DNA preps and what 16 sRNA sequences are like and how to use chime and how to predict things. And we're now looking at time series, we've done this for three years. So we can look at changes in the um, abundance of the microorganisms that, that eat lots of heavy metals and the like. Um, it's really uh, been a wonderful experience. And it, it, there's a larger uh, community in which this is part called the Tribal College Consortium on Genomics Training, which has a somewhat broader mission. Um, but education for natives turns out to be really hard. There are no graduate programs at any tribal colleges except one school of nursing. And uh, addressing undergraduates, uh, has to really reach freshmen. A lot of natives don't get past community college. So we've been working on how can we substitute more genomic-based uh, science into the two weeks that they spend on their freshman biology class on Punnett Squares. We can do better. I've learned a lot by working with these folks about what's valued in these Native American communities, and I've really benefited from seeing these perspectives. It's been a real, a, a tremendous virtue of working outside of my comfort zone. And I think we're going to try to expand this data, data science and genomics piece in, in future years to deal with endangered species, which are important to many tribal communities. Um, and we are looking for long-term sustainability for this. This is funded by one-time NIH money for this year. So if you have ideas, I'd love to hear about them. All right, I, I appreciate your patience. Russ and I both tend to go on for a bit. So I'm going to, I'm going to end with uh, uh, a parfit sort of like approach to encourage you to expand your conceptions of who you are and to, to encourage you to seek to, to nurture all of the factors that make you who you are and our community who we are. Uh, and, and I have four suggestions. Um, be good to each other. That's the first one. That's easy. But the, hard, the next one is a little harder, which is I encourage you to read some more humanities. Read some philosophy or some bioethics or uh, dive into the science and technology studies literature, which is really interesting and relevant. And it's about you. Okay, it's kind of, it's a little weird to be the subject of an experiment. I know you're used to being the investigator, um, but it's important to realize that other people are looking at us and have interesting things to say about what they find. And another thing I would say in sort of the parfit mode um, is encourage, is become more multitudes. We are all multitudes, but we could be more multitudinous. Is that a word? Um, seek difference, okay? The identities that people bring to your lab and that identity could be an ethnic identity, it could be a gender identity, it could be all kinds of identities. That's a kind of knowledge. It brings things to your lab. It's not a disability. We shouldn't think about, oh, that person has an identity of such and such, so we have to take care of them. Identities compose really productively, which is why diversity pays off for everyone, okay? We should all do that. 
And I wish I had more time to talk about climate change and, and sexual harassment and all the very important things that I sort of hinted at in the title that didn't quite get to because I wanted to end by 8.30 and leave some time for questions. But I do want to point out how critically important it is for all of us to participate in the revolution going on uh, that is in, really, I think, has finally a shot to end sexual harassment in our field, and particularly of our trainees and at conferences like this one. So please. Have hope, be angry, be courageous, let's do good. Thank you. I would be happy to take questions if any of you wanted to engage about this now. And I would also understand if you're all tired and drunk and want to go home. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, I'm an interloper. I'm actually a philosopher of science, and I'm wondering if you can tell me how philosophers can treat computational biologists and help in this endeavor. Oh, my God. Uh, well, you already have. So I will, I will name a couple of my favorite philosophers of science and that I think have really had a positive effect in, in our fields. Um, I'll start with Lindley Darden, um, who is not quite as famous, perhaps, as some, but she uh, is the, the author with Carl Craver of what's sometimes called the new mechanistic theory of the science of biology. So most philosophy of science has really been philosophy of physics. And uh, physics is really interesting and important, but uh, the philosophy that describes what physicists do doesn't fit very well for what biologists do. We are not trying to find law-like behavior. Um, so what Lindley and her colleagues have done is talk about how what biologists do is search for mechanisms. Um, and I find it totally compelling. A lot of the people in my lab are using Lindley's ideas about, say, the virtues and vices of a mechanistic theory to try and write code that can evaluate hypotheses uh, but based on those philosophical approaches to what biologists are doing. And the other philosopher I want to call out is Dan Dennett, who is perhaps better known, a uh, philosopher of mind, also the author of Darwin's Dangerous Idea, I think one of the philosophers who has engaged most um, deeply with the scientific community and I think really fairly profoundly affected a lot of what cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, and even some geneticists have done. Uh, fascinating talk. I, um, I, I'm going to ask a slightly provocative question, <laughs> which is um, when we look at humans as a product of evolution and we look at animals and how they live in communities, etc. I'm curious if you have some insights to share about the emergence of altruism and sort of being good. In other words, um, you know, how, how does it manifest in the animal world? How does it manifest in primates? This whole sense of community, it's clearly not a human specific idea, but in a way it's so deeply ingrained into our biology, this whole concept of ethics and, you know, behavior and, you know, altruism and helping others and so on and so forth. There's something that clearly makes us feel good about it. And I'm curious, how do you select for such a thing? You know, do you have any sort of more core biological insights about the biology of ethics rather than the ethics of biology? Uh, well, I, I, I will point to some. They're not my ideas. I think Dennett actually is very smart on this. And he talks about uh, the selective value in, in social animals uh, of, of various kinds of ethics and how that might have gotten bootstrapped and, and why it might matter. And I would point to not just primates and cetaceans as, as having rich societies that, that show evidence of altruism and, and caring for others and this idea of a broader community, but, but also elephants and, and there's a wide variety of non-human species, um, social animals for the most part. And um, maybe I'd stick with social mammals. Uh, I'm not sure I'd give it to social insects, but uh, you can see an awful lot of, of community and communitarian uh, action in non-humans, uh, certainly true. Hey Larry, th thanks for that uh, extremely thought-provoking talk. Um, I've been thinking since Barbara's, Barbara Engelhart's talk the other day, and you brought this up too, about hype in the use of AI for medicine. Um, and as someone who works at a hospital, you know, hearing the, the sky-high expectations that some of my colleagues have that I think are sometimes rather overheated and kind of encouraged by people who are 
hyping, you know, they're not being entirely honest about what they're they're doing maybe with themselves as well. Like, are there things that we can do more immediately, you know, within the community to, to counter this hype? Because you can set up things like medical affairs departments, but having regulation to prevent this thing will take a lot longer. What can we do now? Oh, well, I, I think engage with those and speak up. One of the things that we can do is use our expertise to, to temper uh, those kinds of, of uh, hype-based or unreasonable expectations. Um, there are some good metaphors we can use to help explain what, what machine learning is good for. My favorite one is, is um, uh, due to this guy named Benedict Evans, who is a technology guru who I don't usually love, but his metaphor for what machine learning is, is imagine what you could do if you had 10,000 well-trained 10-year-olds. Okay? And that's like, yes, that's what machine learning could do. That's exactly right. So it scales, but the, they're not as smart as you think they are. Soren. Yeah, thank you, Larry. I'm very happy that I didn't stay in the bar uh, and, and, <laughs> went, and went here. So um, my youngest daughter, she just um, finished the high school assignment on um, apartheid. And uh, she asked me, um, it's a two-week thing, so she asked me, can I beef it up from some scientific angle? And I encouraged her to, to look into DNA and apartheid. And then she stumbled over uh, the statement that Craig Venter made in the White House when the human genome was uh, announced with Bill Clinton and all, all that, where he said that um, the, the, the concept of race um, has no scientific basis. I was actually surprised to hear that again, but I mean, um, uh, very interesting um, statement in relation to the DNA sequence. But then we are going around now making um, uh, sort of reference genomes for a ton of different populations. So, so and I think it's a little bit difficult to to explain to the general public this uh, statement he made. And at the same time, we have to make reference genomes in a very sort of um, um, detailed way for, for, for different populations in order to make precision medicine happen. And you also alluded to it yourself. So, so how do we deal with this uh, overall overarching theme of, of race being a non-scientific concept, but still uh, we work on creating cohorts that can look into subpopulations in Turkey versus uh, whatever um, in, in, in the efforts we do in precision medicine. Yeah, so, so race is a, is a social construct that has no scientific basis, but yeah. ancestry and genetic populations are real. And so we can talk about our shared ancestry. I think that's always a good place to start. And we can talk about divergences within our ancestry. Um, it's, it's interesting that when people aren't moved over long distances, ancestrally informative markers can be incredibly specific. This turns out to be true in Ireland especially, because Irish people don't like moving from village to village, OK? So you can use, and by the way, Ireland has been genome sequenced to death. We have a ton of information about Ireland. So I can use markers, genomic markers, to pick out what county in Ireland you're likely to be from. So those, those populations, that set of, that ancestry is a real thing. And those ancestries have differences, okay? The skin color thing I talked about uh, is not a, a, a genetic population. There's no ancestral history to, to skin color generally. But there are uh, ancestral populations um, that do have a lot in common and might have different needs in medicine and might have different strengths as well as weaknesses that are worthy of study. So studying the, the structure of human populations and talking about our, our ancestry, both shared and distinct, is a perfectly reasonable, important scientific thing to do. Those just do not correlate even as proxies with the socially constructed ideas of race. No, I, I totally agree, but I think my question was more on how do we communicate that? 
I did my best. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure I have anything yeah. better. <laughs> but, but I think uh, you spent I, I too many Tanya, words, Larry. The, we, we need to yeah, okay. there, ha, ha, have a more handy and practical way of, of um, so if telling you look, people that studying their ancestry is not the same as dividing people into different races and... and uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, I, I acknowledge that it's a difficult problem, but I, I'm just... Well, so one, one way is to use pictures. Uh, so if you look at some of the Ancestry of Skin Color uh, articles, um, then you will find this, this wonderful, there's a 256 bin uh, uh, thing that was used to do, to do the, the population ancestry that looks at my, tiny minor gradations in skin color, which turn out to have some genomic basis. And skin color is fascinating, okay? The, it, it's a very rapidly evolving trait. Um, and it turns out that there's one major allele, that, or one, one major gene, really, that it highly influences melanin content in skin. Um, and the promoter upstream of it is in a hypervariable region that has easily broken DNA, um, which is probably why skin color evolves so quickly. Um, it's a really a fascinating study, so I would encourage people to dive in. But at any rate, if you go back to look at those papers, you can see these incredibly fine-grained distinctions in skin color and see how continuous it is. And this is also true for other markers of, of race, so the shape of your eyes or ears or lips or any of those things, they all continuously vary. Um, and so I think one good way to, to show the world uh, about the continuity of our relationship is to use pictures. Yeah, good point, Bill. Bill. Hey, Larry. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, not just for your talk, but uh, if Russ is one degree of separation in a couple of ways that you know very well, I'm two degrees of separation. So I, I, I really appreciate that. I just want to sort of add to your list, or at least propose to add to your list and see, get your reaction to things. So I would say that uh, to one of the, and it covers all the aspects of sex, race, AI, all of these things. And one of them has to do with openness and transparency in what we do. And I, I'd really like to get any further thoughts that you have on that. The other is really, it goes beyond just the ethics and the bioethics, it's really, the interdisciplinary nature and how we should embrace m more and more the interdisciplinary nature of what we're doing now, which begins to cross over in so many other ways. And the third one is really the, the sort of, what I, I would pose at least, is the, the unification of the people doing this work. We, we exist in a hierarchy which I think is really, uh, in some ways disrespectful, but also really works against us acting as a collective. And these are sort of three things that I would add to your three bullets, and I'd just be interested in what your thoughts are about. All right, well, let me see if I can remember all three of them. <laughs> so I'm total, I really love openness and transparency uh, as a characteristic of science. I don't think, so, I don't think if, it's, if it's not open and, uh, and available to other scientists for inspection and review and understanding, it's not science. There is no such thing as secret science, okay? The, you can't do that. There is secret engineering. Um, and I think that we have to recognize that the capitalist economy that most of us live in, uh, and for that matter, the major alternatives to it, say in China, um, all allow uh, small groups of, let's say, entrepreneurs or the like, uh, to keep quiet something that they're working on until they're ready to share it, and not always share the details of how it works, the idea of trade secrets and the like. And I'm not against that. I think that some very useful kinds of, of uh, activities and engineering can be done um, in secrecy, but I don't think science can be done in secrecy. And for those of us who think we're doing science, I think we need to be as open and transparent as possible. The second one. Interdisciplinary. Ah, the interdisciplinary nature of this. Yeah, so Russ called me a polymath, and I think that's very nice of him, but not really that true. Um, I am interested in everything, just not all that good at all that stuff. And I think one of the wonderful things about being an academic um, that we should all take advantage of, no matter where we are in academia, from undergraduates to, to you know, tenured full professors, is you are paid to learn things, okay? Don't just learn a few things. Don't just burrow in all the way deep. Use the fact that it's your job to learn new stuff, to learn new stuff. And be, new stuff is interesting everywhere, okay? So read the science part, you know, the science news part and if something interests you about what's going on in some exoplanet somewhere, 
uh, or if you, you read something about you know, uh, algae for fuels or uh, all kinds of things, follow up on that, learn about it. And I would encourage us to read outside of even science and pay attention to the humanities more, which is what I was trying to do. And then your third one is about the organization of science and academia. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> um, talk about anger and courage. Okay, one of the things that I have been trying to do as a, as a you know, tenured to full professor old guy is to try and fix stuff at my medical school, which is really hard. Um, the, the powers that be and the way money flows and who gets to make decisions are really deeply entrenched in our academic system. It's one of the reasons I like teaching uh, in the ethics class about other, uh, other societies and other nations' ways of doing science because it's really different in Europe, and really different in South Korea, and really different in China. Um, and so uh, I don't think any of us have figured out the right way to organize the very limited amount of money we have for science, um, and uh, certainly, certainly not current academia. I would like to try and make it better, although I don't know really exactly how I would make it better, other than just flood resources into it and make it sexier. Um, but I do try to, to um, find the the evil bits inside the system I am part of. Um, and so my pr school-wide promotion and tenure committee would count as one of the evil bits. Um, and try to do better uh, when I'm on that committee about you know, saying, hey, did you actually read the papers instead of count the number in first of senior authors and whether they got a renewed R01? Can we talk about the quality of the science just a little bit during these proceedings? Um, but I'm afraid, as I think Rutherford said about the rest of science, that it's going to progress one funeral at a time. <laughs> Sad but true. Thank you. Hi, so I wanted to pick up on something you said in your talk, also a couple of the previous questions, about the issue of um, overhyping some of the potential, uh, overhyping the results of a particular study, and also overhyping what might result. And I would argue that this area, that's a more extreme problem. It's a problem for all of science, but I think it's particularly important because I, I come from more the biological side than the computational side. And I have some colleagues who are perfectly intelligent in other ways, but when they get to something computational, they close off and it's a black box. And so that means that they're unable to evaluate in the ways that they would evaluate a lot of other fields. So I think that there is a special difficulty in the computational areas that the people in the area understand what's going on, and it's more opaque to people outside the field than is true for many other uh, branches of science. So that means that the, the uh, mechanisms and the importance of ways to counteract overhyping, the ways to evaluate what something is really worth, they become more and more important in this area. And I'm not sure, I, I'd be interested in your ideas about how we could go about that because you, what you like is almost an independent review of any important paper that gets out there. And that's a hard mechanism to put in place. But I, Well, you know, ideally peer review happens before the paper gets out there and hopefully in computational papers or computational grant proposals and the like, there's more and more computational expertise being brought to bear. To a certain degree, this is another one of those problems that's going to be solved one funeral at a time. So kids coming up are not as afraid of computers as they used to be. And in fact, I think things have gotten a lot better during my career. So I, people used to say in, the early, in my early times um, that biologists were people who loved science and couldn't do math. And that's why they went into biology. And that's really no longer true. There's an awful lot of, of quantitative sophistication in, in even now mid-career people um, that's really kind of required, I think, to, be, to have a successful mm -hmm. career in bio, some kinds of biology these days. And I think that the computational stuff will work its way through society and there will be a, an inevitable bust when people realize that the machine learning stuff that we're doing isn't going to replace doctors and, and, and lawyers and everybody else. It'll be a tool. Um, I sort of suspect that machine learning will end up being a little bit like relational databases, that everybody will use them a little bit, but it's not going to make anybody really particularly unemployed. I mean, aside from you know clerks who used to file stuff, right? They're none of those anymore. But um, the consequence will be more modest than a lot of the uh, you know the super intelligence Nick Bostrom kind of of the sky is falling predictions. Um, on, on the other hand, we do need to learn how to evaluate the claims that are made, and we need to train scientists in biology and elsewhere 
about how to evaluate these claims. And I, I'm confident we'll get there. Um, and in the meantime, those of us who do understand it have to raise our hands and say, not so fast. And by the way, if you prevent the mm -hmm. hospital from spending, I don't know, how much did MD Anderson spend on Watson? 200 million, something like that? Um, if, you can, if you can save the, even hospitals pay attention to that much money. Yes. Right, because I think that I, I'm somewhat cynical about um, manuscript review. I think grant review is often a higher standard. But so that's why I was thinking of the need for a post publication mechanism of, of bringing out. There are lots discussion. of people trying to do that. So, you know, faculty with thousand and lots of people messing with publication models. And, you know, I think I'm really fascinated by the experiment that is the, the bio archive and the, and the general archive, the, the preprint world. Um, I've, been, I've been on panels since 1993, I'm pretty sure, about the future of scientific publishing. Um, and that future has definitely not arrived yet, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but I do think the idea that people can kind of put papers out there and then get and respond to comments from a broad community and improve that paper and have you know, a live paper that, that improves over time. I'm hopeful for, for some of this stuff to actually make a difference in the way that we communicate and evaluate each other's work. But this all ties into what Phil was talking about in terms of getting jobs and promotions and stuff like that. You know, as long as the incentive system wants you to have a science or nature paper, then by God, I will do, or my students or whatever, will do whatever it takes to get that paper. And so that's kind of a more fundamental problem that's, I think, driving the, some of the issues with review, not to mention the fact that publishers have been uh, wildly profitable, and in fact, an awful lot of scientific societies are run off the back of the profits of publications. And so we, gotta, we have to come up with a new economic model to organize ourselves. It's all a little complicated. Thank you very much. Um, I was actually, I genuinely appreciate the fact that you're spending a lot of time trying to evaluate the important things that need to be taught in ethics courses to students. But when you ask the question, um, how do you react when your professor hits on you? I think there needs to be room also to ask the question, why shouldn't you hit on your student, right? Oh, right, why no, so, yeah, so my uh, absolutely. Is, are there ethics courses for professors and shouldn't there be? Oh, Jesus, uh, every time, so I, I worked at the federal government for 10 years at NIH, and so anytime anybody in the federal government did something wrong, we would all get a training for two hours about how you shouldn't do that. Okay. After you've done something wrong. No, we, did not, we didn't. Somebody oh, okay. else did. Okay. I see. Um, and I, I found those trainings utterly useless. And so I don't know what the right way to take powerful people and convince them of the error of their ways. Okay, there's nothing I could, you know, Jim Watson was shamed pretty profoundly and actually apologized briefly once, which he clearly didn't mean and took back. Um, but uh, uh, it's really hard to take powerful, entrenched people and make them see the error of their ways. And some of them are open to it and are, are, are improvable, and some of them are not, which is why I think we have to give students and people who are on the short end of the power stick some tools to deal with what happens when things go the wrong way. So I still want to do that. Um, I don't think making professors go to ethics classes is a good way to get them to improve their behavior. Every once in a while, it is useful to say, hey, there's some new rules. You should be aware of these, because if you violate this, you're going to lose your grant. I would like some more of those rules in the harassment world, by the way. Um, and so that can be useful. Um, but I think culture change happens in different ways among the powerful. And I think partly it's by having the culture around us change. And so I, would, I, I, I don't have a good solution to how to make powerful people behave better, other than surround them with other people who are behaving better, and let's see if that influences them. But I just want to like emphasize the, the power of constant conversation, and if those are made mandatory, I think that's a part of it. So I understand that these are often seen as just like you're, they're obligatory, or there's something that they have to go through, but I mean, there is value in actually enforcing a conversation, and I do think that uh, all right, I'm going I'm to push back just a little bit and, and suggest that from my, my experience, a better, more effective way is to have that conversation personally. So I see my responsibility as the old white guy in the room, when I'm in a room full of only old white guys, to call them out on something I don't like about what they did. Okay, that's my job. Um, and so 
the peer interaction, the speaking up and not just averting your eyes and say, oh, yeah, he's troubled, just ignore him. Right. Um, but actually having that conversation, not in a required way in a classroom where everybody has to sit down for two hours and they'll all be on their phones ignoring what's going on, but in a more personal, uh, um, doesn't have to be confrontational, but uh, explicit way. And I think that that kind of peer interaction is one of the few things that actually does influence senior people. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Larry, for a great talk. You hit on so many really great points, but I want to hit on one. So the whole concept of reading outside of our specialties and humanities, and um, so I took a little effort. I looked at your CV when you're going through this, and you're talking through an audience of people who are graduate, mostly graduate students and above, who are trained very exclusively in STEM. You weren't. You have an undergraduate degree in psychology. We can argue how that no, is. No, you want to, uh, I'll tell you a story about that well, undergraduate we can, we, degree we in can psychology. Talk about that later. But the point is, I think it's really, so let me ask you I, th you know, I think it's really important that people who go into STEM get that training earlier on in terms of exposure to the humanities, exposure to the social sciences, so they can define relevant and ethical questions to approach. What Absolutely. So I love the liberal arts education. Okay, I think that the evisceration particularly in high schools and, and primary schools of arts education and, and languages and, and you know, the, the, the ubiquitous promotion of science and technology education at all levels. Um, there is an element of that that's good. There are a lot of kids who could really excel in science and technology or math uh, if only they had access to it. And a lot of teaching in a lot of schools uh, I have learned a lot about Native American high schools. It's terrible in those regards, and we're doing those kids a terrible disservice by not giving them access to, to real science and technology and the like. But uh, in, in primary schools, secondary schools, and colleges, I do think that the, the, the ideal of a liberal education, where you have to learn a little bit about everything, and you can't just be a nose to the, to the grindstone pre-med, um, is really good for all of us. Uh, it's a, uh, I, I argue on my campus and elsewhere, it's a kind of losing battle at the moment, but uh, you gotta, gotta fight that but good it's, fight. It's a, it's a losing battle when you hit graduate school or medical school. A lot of medical schools require it for admissions. But <laughs> that's one way to make it happen. That's one way to make it happen, but graduate schools don't. I mean, you know, gra graduate school admissions committees, what's your research experience, what's your productivity? I mean, it's, it's really focused on the, that digging down, and I think it's really counterproductive in the long term. Well, I, I, let me at least defend my own graduate program and, and say that um, in, in some ways, uh, and you know, this may not be true at Stanford or MIT, but for most of us in other institutions, the kind of computer science students we want to come into our computational biology programs have to have a motivation to do it. Other than, you know, why aren't they just taking the Google or Amazon or whatever job or Facebook and making a gazillion dollars and using their undergraduate computer science skills for, for selling ads on the internet? Um, and all of our students come pretty much with some personal story. Um, some family member who was ill. I have the world's only, I think, Argentinian vegan in my lab uh, who really <laughs> wants to come up with alternatives to, to animals. Um, People come into our graduate programs because they're highly motivated to do science for some reason or another. And people who have those motivations, I, I think, are easily persuaded that, that reading the bioethics literature or the humanities generally or the like is relevant to them. I agree completely. Thanks. Thank you. I really appreciate the, your talk. And um, since you mentioned Me Too STEM, and then you uh, several times mentioned that you're involved with NIH, so what is your opinion on uh, Francis Collins' stance on sexual harassment and NIH be insisting on uh, funding sexual harassers? Oh, I think NIH is way behind the curve. And Collins and Larry Tabak, can I find any NIHers here, are part of the problem. Um, and they have not done as much as NSF has. And I think some very basic kinds of things, like uh, people who are, who are uh, found to be harassers by whatever their institutional process is, shouldn't be allowed to be PIs on training grants. That seems to me a no-brainer that we should do. Um, and so uh, we, we got to you know, keep the pressure up on Collins and, and to back in the NIH administration. They formed yet another committee, and there's yet another study being done. It's like, does anybody have any doubts there's harassment in science? Really? Come on, guys. I think he's just temporizing until he retires. But um, we, we got to keep at it. Kyle. <laughs>
that last oh, one. Oh, so this is this oh, is why you're all here. <laughs> uh, very great, great speech. Very, very thoughtful. One of the things you brought up is this this issue of the modern age, which is really around equality of data. That is, if we have data that's not representative of the population, we allow our machines to learn from it. It creates discriminatory and unequal outcomes as you go forward. And that's very, very analogous to the business problem we're facing with discriminatory algorithms in, say, the credit and mortgage world that are learning from data from a, a segregated time in our past. And the sort of discussions about, well, should we create synthetic data sets or do other things to teach these machines about a different world? So my question to you is really around solutions. If you were to give this talk to the World Health Organization, what would you ask them for? to address this problem? Because you're, you're raising something important, but it may not be something which we can solve just in academia alone. Um, that's a great question, Kyle. Um, so it, until you got to the World Health Organization, uh, I thought the answer is, look, there's a lot of interesting work on algorithmic fairness, on trying to come up with technical solutions to some of these problems so we don't re-inscribe biases uh, in uh, are the machine learning or the other kinds of algorithms that we create. And it turns out that's a, a, it's not an entirely technically solvable problem because we've been looking for basically 100 years for fair algorithms and there really is no such thing. You have to take into account the context in which people live. And I had one slide that I said a, a people is, it has a history, the population with a history. Um, and so uh, I do think that we need to bring all of our collective intelligence together to bear as well as make technical innovations to try and make our algorithms achieve our social goals like fairness. Um, with respect to what I would ask the World Health Organization to do um, would be to really, uh, and it's not their mission, but to really empower scientists all over the planet to, to build capacity so that people could make their own decisions about how to deploy technologies and, and deploy what we know to meet their own needs of their own communities um, and to come together to meet bigger and bigger and more global needs, um, but also have real local action with people who have the skills, the resources, uh, the education to, to be able to use this wonderful technology we've been developing for their own ends. And I'm not sure the WHO could do that, but that's what I would ask. Good ask. Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you all very much.